we have a panel of two folks in person and two folks online, uh, two spirit trans plus uh, folks who are going to talk to us today. Salish Wesley, who you met last night, if you were here last night, uh, is going to moderate. And uh, Salish is a two spirit educator and knowledge keeper of the Stalo and Simshin descent. Uh, currently, she works as an Indigenous Enhancement Education teacher for the Chilliwack School District, which is over on the mainland, and also continues to present at a wide variety of events as it relates to her Two-Spirit and Indigenous teaching. So Salish is our moderator. Uh, so on the screen uh, is uh, Sikani Dakel. Uh, uses the pronouns she, her, and Sakani has been working within and besides the trans acceptant movement in the downtown east side for many years. Uh, she's very passionate about folks getting to achieve freedom and acceptance, and she talks to parents and youth groups about acceptance and how important having supports is for youth. Up on the stage is Sandra Laframboise, uh, who identifies as Two-Spirit and Trans. And Sandra is Algonqu Algonquin Cremati, a Two-Spirit spiritual leader, an elder, a knowledge keeper, and a transgender person. She has led ceremonies throughout North America and Europe, most recently in England. And she has also presented research in Switzerland, South Africa, Belfast, and Alaska. Sandra has been an advocate for the LGBT community and transgender rights since 1971. Kai Minosh Pyle is who was going to join us and had uh, family responsibilities and is unable to join us. Uh, but I'll just give you a few words about Kai so you'll know who you're missing. Uh, Kai is Metis and Bawiting Anishinaabe writer, originally from Green Bay, Wisconsin, currently located at the University of Illinois. Uh, their scholarship and creative work focuses on Two-Spirit, Anishinaabe, and Métis history, language revitalization, and queer trans indigenous literature. So perhaps another time we'll have the honor of having Kai join us. On the screen, Kyle Shaughnessy uh, is a trans and Two-Spirit educator, social worker, and writer of uh, Chilso Dene Irish and Ukrainian background. He is originally from all over the Northwest Territories, Nunavut, and rural BC. Kyle's academic and writing work focuses on the intersections between two-spirit ways of being and land-based teachings and ethics. Uh, he works as an indigenous educational consultant at the University of British Columbia on unceded Musqueam territory. So Kyle, mm -hmm. thank you for joining us. Okay, I turn it over to Salish. Okay. Ela teth maquat, palaktanot telsqui, talitzalquas co kale, casta kitsum kalem, casta musculum, casta boothroid. A tal squalawal quals quits lala. Dear friends and relatives, it's wonderful to be here today. I shared with you that my true name is Palaktanot. That comes from an area just outside of, um, just before Hope, the Popcom area in the Fraser Valley. And I said to all of you, it's wonderful to see you this morning. And I am humbled by your presence. And I am grateful that I'm able to be here today. Maybe we'll do a quick round of introductions with our other panelists. Then I'll start in with our questions. Oh, sorry, before we do that. I would also like to acknowledge, I should have done this in the first place, that we are on the traditional un unceded, is it unceded? Yeah. Territory of the Lakonguin, Songhees, Esquimalt, and West Saanich people. It's a wonderful opportunity to be a guest here, and I have many friends and relatives in this territory as well. Okay, so I'll turn it over to, what, where should I go to? Which, whichever. Let's go Sakani. Sakani, Sakani, thank you. I really regret not being in the room and just being able to sit with my folks there. Um, I don't know how you are viewing me, so I thought I was going to appear on that big back screen, like the, the powerful in Oz, and I was going to say, oh, there might be some deities in the room. <laughs> um, that was a joke. But anyways, my name is Sakani. I am from the Lucilieu clan. 
Uh, currently, I am on the land of my relatives, the Clay Tenay, which is commonly known as Prince George. Um, it's the nearest town kind of to where I am, um, living in the north. So it is beautiful and nice to be amongst my people and just being like engulfed in the culture and um, and the language and, and also being able to like find out where I fit in and find out where I can support my folks because these are my people. And I've had such the honor of working in Vancouver and working within the social justice field for so long that I have a wealth of knowledge that I'm able to bring here to these folks. And there's, there's a lot of people already doing a lot of really good work here. So I'm seeing, seeing who I can connect with here. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much. It is so, so good to be here. And oh my God, last night watching that documentary, I just, I just, honestly, I just cried and cried as I was watching it. It was just so beautiful. So thank you so much for having me here. And I really wish I could be there in person. It's just such a lovely experience to be there with you all. Um, but I am also still loving being here online and just being able to be here with Sakani online and, and seeing your beautiful face as well. So thank you so much for the invite. Uh, so my name is Kyle Shaughnessy. Um, I am of mixed uh, Indigenous and European background. So I'm Irish, Ukrainian and Klicho Dene from Yellowknife and WT. Um, I'm also trans and I'm Two-Spirit. And today I am speaking to you from uh, Dene territory. So from my home territory in Yellowknife, uh, where all of my family is. And so I'm up here for a couple of weeks, um, both to see some family and do a little bit of touristing and seeing auroras and stuff, hopefully, as long as it doesn't get too snowy and cloudy tonight. And um, and then next week, I'm going to be uh, teaching and participating in the Living the Dene Laws course out at uh, Dechenta Teaching and Learning Research Center out here. Um, so yeah, I am very excited to be speaking to you today and just very honored to be invited to speak on this panel. So hello, good morning, looking forward to talking. Well, thank you, Kyle. Thank you, Zakani. And now we will move over to the lovely Sandra, who's in the room and it's so nice. She gifted us both something beautiful. We have matching jewelry. <laughs> so it's just just beautiful to be here. Thank you. Thank Sandra. you. Yes. Am I on now? Can you hear me? If you can, I'll. Yeah, I'll have a big voice. Good morning, everybody. Uh, it's lovely to be here. And I too acknowledge the traditional territories that we sit on of the Tsongi people, Squamal people. And am I forgetting someone? Mm -hmm. The Tongwen. Sorry, I speak French normally. The West Sand. And the West Sandwich people. It was beautiful to see Brianna welcome us last night in a traditional way. And I all really, really love it when you can mix our traditional way with the colonial system. So the drums came in, the songs came in, and then the lieutenant governor came in. So it was kind of nice to me, that's reconciliation. Mm -hmm. And we need to do more of that in the future. But before I carry on introducing myself, I'd like to ask a question, if I may. Uh, I'm not the only one that's been around for 50 years or so in this movement. So I would like those of us who've been around long to stand up so that we can recognize you. I think of Lucas Walter, Jamison Green, a wonderful person here from Los Angeles. All of us, Aaron, all of us, please stand up so that we can all be recognized. Yes. Yes, yes, thank you. Thank you, Susan Gupta, you know, and all those that have gone on to Spirit World and those that were here before us. We stand on the shoulders of giants before us and you stand on our shoulders. And it is a privilege to be standing in the room where there's so much powerful people. At times we didn't get along very well. We all had our own struggles, but now we have moved into this beautiful movement that we come together and we celebrate each other. We celebrate the accomplishments we've done. And some of us really struggle. We've got hurt. Some of us really got hurt. So as I say that, I acknowledge that I was born Joseph Francois Léo, 
La Framboise, that's my government name. When I went through today, we call it gender affirming surgery, but it was called sex change in the 70s and the 80s. So I apologize if that's triggering to anybody. Um, SRS, I was the 26th of March, 1987. That's a long, 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 long time ago. Long, long time ago. <laughs> And I've chosen the name of Sandra La Framboise, but in community, I go by Sandy Leo now because I've come to a place that I acknowledge both the male and the female side of me. They both inform who I am and what I do. And my traditional name given to me by Ta Amy George and Damien George Sr. of the Slaywood Tooth and the uh, George clan and the children of the Black Wolf, the Slaywood Tooth, is Kele Laslan Knight. I'm also a member of the Musqueam Two Spirit Collective, and so is Kyle, by the way, and others. Uh, many of us um, are part of different things that we awaken. I am also a researcher. I'm also an elder in residence for AIDS Vancouver, bringing in Indigenous ways of knowing and being. And I'm also the chair of the National Committee on Hepatitis C for CAN, which is Community Alliance and Network Society, formerly known as the Canadian Aboriginal AIDS Network. And I was one of the founders in 1992, we conceived of it. And we um, registered in 1995. So we do a lot of things as trans people. We tend to go like an octopus. We branch out. We have different tentacles or like a tree, if you want. We, we grow our roots. And sometimes it's not because we're all nice and miss this or Mr. That. It's out of necessity. It's out of necessity. We create the space. We are creators, co-creators, and we're shakers and movers. So thank you for hearing these words and thank you for introducing me, Silish. Thank you. Thank all three of you for sharing a bit about yourselves and um, filling the room with warmth before we start. It's um, uncanny how some of us seem to have magic and we're able to connect even if we're virtual. I feel a connection and a, um, a, a it's like as if Kyle and Sakani are sitting here with us. Yeah. And I'm certain Kai's spirit is probably here as well because I'm, I know this would be something that I would normally prioritize unless it's a family emergency. So I extend my gratitude and my well wishes to him on behalf of all of us. And I know that, like I say, he's probably with us in spirit anyways. Mm -hmm. And so to the speakers, I know we did have a bit of an email chain going regarding the questions that I was going to ask, and they have since taken a little bit of a turn, but bear with me, they are doable and meaningful, and I think Sandy sort of segued into that nicely, but we could expand more. So for the sake of consistency, I'll stay in the same order. Is that okay? Is that okay with the two of you? Yes? Okay, wonderful. So I had shared with you last night a little bit about my life and how I understand myself. I don't know that I necessarily shared with you how I identify and how I may identify differently in different contexts. Mm -hmm. um, so this question for all three of you, in regards to the idea of two-spirit, and how it describes how we as Indigenous people, we wield both a male and female spirit. That was the original way to understand the notion of two spirit, that we brought both um, male and female energy with us. And this was coined in 1990, and apparently it's still on the table as to who and, to, and where it was um, coined or, or dreamt about or realized. Um, so when we talk about this original idea of two-spirit, I'm wondering if it suits your identity and if it works as a description of you. 
I use the term to describe myself as it relates to my indigeneity and to separate myself from settler spectrums. But it doesn't work for me to describe my gender and sexuality. I can go into that a bit more, but in, first I would like to hear from Sakani if you were able to follow everything that I just said. I think for, for myself, um, it depends on what, where I am, on what terms I'm using. Um, I often think it, what I'm going to say kind of relates to um, my Angelo's poem, We Wear the Mask, right? You know, I feel like sometimes I'm putting on different masks in which spaces I'm in, and I've got to navigate safety, and I've got to navigate um, my own mental wellness. And by saying that, I mean, um, I've done so much work to identify as a trans woman, like for a long time now, well, I mean, I shouldn't say a long time, I guess since I was 18. So I'm 41 now, I've done a lot of work to identify as a trans woman. And, and I'm proud of that, I'm proud of who I am. And I stand firmly and proudly alongside and, and in many spaces and, and say that. Um, when I use the term, I notice when I use the term two-spirited, some folks are like, they're like, okay, well, what do we use? Do we use she, her? Do we use, um, you know, they, they get confused and they, they just don't know how to address me and they don't know how to communicate with me. So I noticed that it, it really depends on which space I'm in. So I, I usually just say I'm a trans woman and I prefer she, her pronouns, right? But usually sometimes um, when I do say I'm a trans woman, they kind of know you know, um, that I, I prefer she, her pronouns. Um, but yeah, again, I just believe it's like whatever space I'm in. I personally love the term. I love the term two-spirited. I love using it because I do, I do feel like that it's a term created by and for Indigenous folks. And it is kind of all-encompassing. And to me, it means that I'm able to stand alongside my, my um, LGTB 2Q folks that are Indigenous and we're, we are we are like one instead of going like oh well you're you're different because you're gay or you're different because of this you know I do celebrate and honor our differences but I do feel like unity is is more of um when I'm in indigenous spaces unity means more to me than than um than our differences so I don't know if that kind of answer, answers you know what you said I think there's no wrong way to answer Sakani. And so, you know, for me, this journey of being two spirit trans has been something that brings evolution and change along the way for each of us. So um, when I was say, you, you say you're 40, well, I'm 50. So I may have answered this differently when I was 40. Also, when I was 30, I was very young when I you know, I was in a way non-binary when there was no term for non-binary for about a year before I completely accepted and walked into my understanding of what womanhood is. So yeah, no, I think it's a, an individual thing and, and there's no wrong answer. Thank you. And Kyle, do you want me to repeat the question or do you think you're still in context? I think I've got it. Yeah. Just what is my relationship with the term two spirit? Uh, is that basically gets it? Yay. Yay. Yes. Yeah? Yes. Okay. Um, okay. So I would say like, so it is a term that I use. It's, uh, I mean, I've always, uh, previous to now as someone who is gender diverse, sexually diverse, I previously would have said I'm trans. I also have a mixed background I'm indigenous and European. Um, because it took me a while to feel like I could use the term two-spirit because I didn't feel that I understood the historical context behind it. There was, and this was, you know, this is going back a few years, um, but I would say that there was a particular, um, I didn't feel like I had a place yet to use it because I had always known that two-spirit folks, they come with particular gifts and, and roles in their community. And I didn't know what that was for me. Um, so I was hesitant to begin using that term, um, but I wanted to be able to, and I wanted to know um, those aspects of myself and my family and my cultural experience. And so I really dedicated effort to, um, to sort of going through that coming in process to understand what it means to be 
um, gender diverse within my family, within Indigenous spaces and communities. Um, and so I really, you know, asked myself and just encouraged myself to flourish, to find out what are those gifts? What is it that I have to offer? I'm not going to pick up some new skill so that I can offer it. What is it that I already do? How is it that I already carry myself? How is it that I'm already showing up? And what can I bring back to my family, to my community? Um, and so that was a big part of it for me. I always say that I'm trans and two-spirit um, because being trans, I, I don't want to ever uh, forget to acknowledge the things that I've done and experienced as a trans person. Um, the barriers that I've faced or overcome, the relationship with, you know, just having a medicalized existence. And I mean, this is the thing too about being both trans and two-spirited. This is a highly documented way to be in the world, right? Like there's you know, registration, there's letters, there's all sorts of things that have to validate who I am in the world from both angles. Um, and so, uh, yeah, so I do hold both of those in extreme importance in who I am and how I carry myself today. And I, uh, I do often name both of them when I'm introducing myself. I love how you say that, or what, what I'm summarizing from your words is that being trans and two-spirit are ways of being which are in a way on top of how you identify which are two different things but very both very powerful and so and I'm feeling that you are leaning on to the political aspects of it for yourself and you're leaning on your personal aspects and so it's very all-encompassing it seems how you've wielded the notion of two-spirit as to who you are. Thank you very much. When I grew up in this community in Ottawa, they were, we were gays. We were homosexuals and then we became gays and then gays and lesbians. And then in the eighties, gay, lesbian, bisexual and so on. And it's only in the early nineties that publicly as a whole community, the word trans started becoming a common lexicon in our queer communities. I grew up urban. My parents, one is white, the other one is brown, brown skin. And I grew up in a community that was very harsh to be who I was. So we had to be stealth, good language to use. We had to hide. We had to be what we call passable. And don't try to be a man in a dress because you get beaten up. There was no such thing as gender diverse, non-binary in my time period. And so the only thing that was available for people of my type, quote unquote, was the bars, being a drag queen or sex work. So you had to find a way to live. And the commonality in those days in Montreal, when I moved to Montreal, was to be transsexual. Never mind transgender, that didn't exist in our language in Canada. It existed elsewhere, but it didn't exist here in Canada. It was transsexual. And so that period of time for me was denying who I am. I'm a woman, I'm a transsexual woman, and I'm fabulous, right? And you had to really live like that in order to survive. You weren't living, you were surviving. In the 90s, in the early, I think 89, I exited sex work, drug use, and went through rehabilitation and went back to college. I realized there was nothing for our people that was available in that time. So I got really angry. I got really, really angry. And I thought, well, what happens if I go back on the streets and there's no place for me? So that's where I developed a sense of having a duty to my community and to myself to start creating the spaces. So in that process, I went down to Houston, Texas in the mid nineties, and I met Phyllis Randolph Fry. 
And I brought back and I learned all about the model of transgendered, which was big for me. It was like an epiphany, if you want. Simultaneously, we received funding for a drop-in center called the High Risk Project Society. We dealt with people that were sex workers, IV drug users, homeless, and trans. So we were developing that, and I was developing my identity as a transgendered person, as a whole person, and not just a transsexual woman, quote unquote. And simultaneously, my friends in Manitoba at an AIDS conference had a vision. They stopped the conference, and they did a prayer, and they did ceremony. And for them, the word two-spirit came about, which explain our different identity of being indigenous and who we were. And it was based on identity and not sexual or orientation. It was based on cultural identity, which was even stronger for me. Oh, my people recognize who I am. Wow. But... As the movement evolved and as the word progressed, and as I grew up and became more and more Sandra and Sandy Leo and all that, I realized that just two spirit was an English moniker used in a unilateral way to pan indigenize us. So I started walking away from two spirited and telling, well, I'm two spirited, but I'm also transgendered and I don't want to be erased. I fought so long for the T to just be under the umbrella of two and lose the trans. There's no way for me. And so that created a lot of stress in my life and ruffled a lot of feathers, if you want. However, and having said that, I really focus on two parts of my life, two spirit, two icing, two this, two that. And one was establishing myself as a careered person and as an indigenous person and as a trans person. So three eyes, <laughs> right? And, and merging all of that to get to a place where I'm okay with who I am today. Just don't call me late for dinner, you know? Um, I don't use pronouns because sometimes we make mistakes with pronouns and that could be very offensive for people and hurtful. So I prefer to call you by your chosen name. And sometimes I will forget names, but I will not forget faces. So two-spirit and trans for me is a merger of two movement. First, my culture. And second, my community, this larger community. And I had to find the ethical space to work within that. And that's an important part, the ethical space. How do I respect non-Indigenous trans people? And how do I get respected as an Indigenous trans two-spirited person? And it's a very difficult and fine line to walk. Because as you heard in my introduction by Aaron, I'm also known, quote-unquote, as a spiritual leader or recognized two-spirit elder who leads ceremony. And so I really have to focus on the spiritual aspect of things as well. And that's really a big part of me is the spirit. Spirit brought me back to life. It, it left my body in the 70s and it came back and I found my spirit in the mountains and in the woods and in the inlet of Slewa Two Nation. And as such, they've also given me my traditional name. And Although I'm not from that nation, they have given me permission to do land acknowledgement, public land acknowledgement. I can't welcome you on the territory because I'm not from that territory, but I can do a land acknowledgement in a spiritual way. And that is really profound. And it carries a lot of responsibility. As an indigenous person, I have to honor my roots, where I come from, the elders have supported me, the territory I'm on, and honor myself as a trans woman. So that's a huge responsibility to honor yourself, to stand strong in who you are, and to know that who you are doesn't depend on your neighbors or your family, but on who you are. 
our family is our support system and is our roots to the bigger tree. But you have your own tree that you're growing as an individual. So that's where I come from and that's how I'm informed. I hope I've answered your question. <laughs> Sandy, I think that you have definitely given us a very whole and well-rounded response to the question. And it was certainly something that, like I say, um, you may all feel how it transcends time and space almost, the notion of two-spirit, that there is a charge to it. There's a vibration to it. And, um, you know, I think it's a beautiful term I appreciate how it was coined to, um, in a way, authenticate us as Indigenous people across Turtle Island. Um, but the, I, I think that that was the starting point. This is just for me. I'm only speaking for myself. Um, it was a good starting point to give us platform and to feel like we had a place. We were one of the colors of the rainbow. Um, we just we we just felt like space was created for us in a way with that movement and with that quest where where like I'm said the origin of the, the term is is under discrepancy right now, um, but the point is that I still find that where I've come now all these years later, I don't necessarily understand myself to have two spirits. Um, I feel like I have three. I think I shared this last night. There's a child in me and he's a dear little boy. Mm -hmm. And he is the one that I, the adult, cherish and love and do what I can to keep him well because his life was full of trauma as, as you saw in the film. And he was basically punished without cause for being who he was, which wasn't the male that he was expected to be. So that dear child now is safe for the most part. And this adult that you see in me is the one before you who shares the ways that I've come to understand and know about this identity. There's an elder in me as well. And that elder is um, is the one that helps the people. What I was talking about last night, that elder is the one who um, helps me to dig deeper into understanding where I am, who I am, and how I relate to the world. And so there's this three-spirited consciousness, I guess, is something that it's evolved to for me. And um, But like I say, I use it, I use the term two-spirit carefully because I still value it I still hold respect for it it's just not always fitting for every circumstance um, we don't have a lot of time left but I just wanted to follow up I know Sandy had alluded to this because this is one of the original questions that I was going to bring up but I'm not certain how long we have so we might have to keep it okay Oh, wow. <laughs> Are we okay? <laughs> okay, so we were afforded a bit more time. Um, I wanted to talk to the panelists originally about the notion of three-eyed seeing. I had heard this concept in a Zoom call with a committee that I sit on and I sit on many. And so what had happened was I was sitting with a group of other two-spirit folk mm. and there were only four or five of us. And they had spoken about the notion of two-eyed seeing, which in my mind is an understanding that indigenous people across Turtle Island have to walk in two worlds. Mm -hmm. when we go out into society and when we work, when we have to, you know, go to school, to a funk place like this, 
it's it's quite um, the undertaking because when we come in into a setting like this, for example, as a student or a faculty member, and given the nature of the institution where we're always having to argue, that's the main um, verb when we write. I've been a non-practicing scholar for some time. And so this notion of arguing and proving and validating what it is that you're trying to convince the readers of isn't necessarily conducive, at least with my people, because in the world out here, I would have to be aggressive. I would have to make sure that I'm heard and seen. I'd have to pretend that I have privilege so that people might believe me and use the language and the um, attitude that what I have to do and say is required. And so I have to turn it all off because that nature, that aggressiveness, that way of being that doesn't necessarily wield humility isn't conducive to how I am expected to carry myself with my community and my family. When I have elders in the room in a big house, like last night, I mean, it's a, it's a different, it's more of a real setting where there's actual fires. Um, <clears throat> if there are elders present, I am seen and not heard. And it isn't about a disrespect of me, it's about respecting your elders. And what they say goes, the elders are the law. And so you, I've watched other colleagues who are actually, you know, professors who completely remove their hats and their badges and the titles behind their name, and they defer to the elders. So that's the notion of two-eyed seeing, and it really applies to um, our cisgender Indigenous sisters and brothers. And so for us, as two-spirit, as trans people, I heard these other folk, good folk, say to me, I have, we have to three-eyed see. And so I'm wondering if that resonates with you and if that's something that you feel you are doing in a way like a superpower. I love it. I love that you said you ended there with superpower. <laughs> Sometimes I do feel like it is my superpower, you know, being able to, like I mentioned earlier, wear the mask. And I feel like sometimes um, I call it coasting, you know, I'm just coasting into this room and just like staying at the edges and always worried about how careful I have to be with my language and, and worried about how, why I have to be careful is, that I, I want to be perceived a certain way in this room, right? Um, so oftentimes, you know, um, you know it, it, it depends on which mask I'm wearing in that room. You know, like, um, I believe that we do it all the time and it becomes, well, I'm sorry, I shouldn't say we, I do it all the time and that it becomes so natural to me that I don't know I don't realize I'm doing it until I have to like, until I have to check in with my authentic self and actually say, okay, I'm I gotta ground myself and I gotta check in with my authentic self and go, okay, what am I doing here? Who am I forgetting? What parts of, of myself am I forgetting or am I leaving behind? You know, is it worth it to leave these, these parts of me behind in order to coast in this space? You know, sometimes it just, you know, I, I grew up in the in the 80s and 90s so I grew up on a lot of like um, music really really awesome music and one of those songs they say check yourself you know <laughs> it's check yourself before you wreck yourself so, so how I interpret that is like okay well I'm going to check in with myself because I don't want to wreck myself just to coast in this space but at the same time oftentimes you know we have to do the work and we have to challenge ourselves and we have to say like, okay, well, if, if I leave this space and I'm the only Indigenous two-spirited trans person in this space, 
then they are going to lose out on a valuable part of 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 seeing what um seeing what talents and and knowledge we can bring to the table you know um so you know it really it really um i've always i feel like i have many 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 more than three more than three masks that i have to wear you know so it, it and and that's just something that is born from survival something that is born from um empowerment you know all those masks are different and and to how i shape them is, is going to look different so yeah thank you i really appreciate how you do share um your interpretation with that discussion as a mask. So it's not more than just your eyes. It's the things you say, it's the things you listen to, it's the things you feel. Um, and in many ways we are multi um, faceted and we do have more than one set of ears, more than one set of eyes, more even more than one set of mouths. And so it's quite, quite the, um, gymnastics that we have to do from situation to situation right Kyle I'm wondering if you have a spin on the notion of three-eyed scene as I shared it earlier thank you so much what a beautiful term I actually hadn't heard it um until engaging around this panel so being able to hear a little bit more about what is meant by that has been really helpful and I think um yeah, just that notion of walking in multiple spaces, walking in multiple worlds, holding multiple identities. And it's not even about being a different version of myself in different spaces. It's about maybe highlighting a different side of myself in different spaces. And I think, you know, when I, one of the things that's important to me as holding a two-spirit identity is that is my most favorite self. When I am in a space and I am my most authentic, when I am able to, based on the environment and based on my own comfort and safety, share a little bit about gender diversity, share a little bit about what two-spirit means, or maybe I'm sharing a lot. Maybe there's people who are really interested and excited and want to hear it. Sharing, you know, a little bit about those aspects of myself, but really being in my element. And that, um, that is one of the things that Two-Spirit means to me. It's a bit about what I see as my role in my family and in my community is to do some of that change work by being my most full favorite and authentic self in the space. And when I do that, um, allowing there to be a, a better understanding of what it means to be Two-Spirit, of what it means to be gender diverse, just being fully present. Um, and I think one, like a really good example of that is um, a few years ago, uh, I was up um, in uh, Clicklitane uh, territory up in Prince George, and I was uh, facilitating, uh, well, I was supposed to be facilitating a workshop on gender diversity on um, a little bit on two spirit. And uh, there was just something happened logistically with the workshop and oh, there was two events. And so we only had a few people in there and it was myself and maybe one other person and just like a few like aunties in the space. And I mean, we went from expecting to do this like formalized presentation around like gender diversity. Here's the terms. Here's the gender bred person. Like, here's all the things. And it was just too small a group. So we just sat around and talked. And so I just shared the most like ridiculous, weird thing that just happened to me trying to use a men's bathroom. And we just sat there and we laughed and we talked about using different bathrooms and like these faux pas and weird things that happened. But I wasn't sitting there talking about like, here's what two spirit means. Here's what trans means. It wasn't this formalized talk. It was just being, just having fun. And just being there and just sharing what it's like um, to live that daily experience in a method that makes sense in that space to just sit around the table and tell stories and have some laughs. And um, I remember that experience. And I think that it's things like that. How do I bring in all of who I am in those spaces to be a two-spirit person? And I think that's from what I'm grasping so far around the concept of three-eyed seeing, that's I don't know, that's just something that comes up for me when I'm thinking about it, is really being in that in that element all at once. So what I glean from that is that 
the notion of identifying as or, or, or perceiving the world through three different lenses is much more complex than it may seem. And that you do have to find your comfortable space where you feel balanced with all three lenses. And that's your chosen favorite place to be. And I think it's probably where we will all default to. And it occurred to me to even think of one more lens. So now it's moving to four I'd seen for me. Um, I don't necessarily always see you human beings. I, I first see your spirits. And so it's a, another level of understanding and sorting through the messiness of how we have to move through the world with one another. And so when I am in a room, I guess that's one of my own superpowers is that I'm able to look past your physical body to see who you really are, including the ego that we all carry in our heads that is our tool to help us move in the world in a good way for the most part. The ego is often stigmatized and gets a bad rap because it's often used in ways that aren't necessarily healthy. But our ego is there as a tool. It's like akin to be having our brain. What do we want to accomplish in the world if to be happy? And what do we want the world to think of us? Those dialogues are your ego. Whereas your spirit is just about who you really are. And regardless of what you want the world to think, who you really are, that person you see in the mirror and the conversations you have with that person in the mirror is, is actually having a conversation with your true self. Mm -hmm. So that was where I, I was going with that myself. Thanks to Kyle, Sandy. Um, big question. Big question. Thank you. Um, when I first started to learn about two eyes seeing approaches, it was more of a scholarly way. It's um, an indigenous scholar from East who used the two eyes seeing approach to explain colonial ways of doing research and indigenous ways of doing research and how to find the ethical space within that and how we can work together because each side can offer a bigger picture of things. And as I grow up and as I age now, I'm in, a, in the elderly category physically, <laughs> spiritually and emotionally, I'm starting to see different aspects. So for me, um, and I want to relate it to the word two-spirit as well, because two-spirit was the beginning, as Salish said, but now there's an emergence of um, our young Indigenous people want to learn the name or a word in their nation's language, in their culture, of what Two-Spirit is, because it ties them to their land, to their nation. And so in doing so, to me, that would be the third eye seeing, is having our youth coming in and saying, okay, this worked, this is great. But now let's add something. Let's evolve, just like our language has evolved like over the, the exactly, like that tree that I talked about. And, and also, I agree for I seeing. I'm, I'm an elder now, an elderly. And so the care and how I conduct myself and the needs that I have are different from when I was 40. Now that I'm over 60s, and I won't say my true age yet. <laughs> and um, when I was a, a youth and a child. So it's almost like the phases of transition from a child, a youth, a teen, an adult, and now an elderly. So to me, that would be the four eyes for me. Um, and again, I really like the notion that we say, for me, we own where we come from, we own where we are, and we say, these are my thoughts. Doesn't just necessarily mean it's, it's everybody's. We make the space. We make the space for everybody's differing opinions and views. And that's the beauty of our ways. 
You know, that's the beauty of our ways. We make that space. And it was hard. I have to admit, it was hard to go through all of that. Um, I remember, and I'm using a decolonization lens in ceremonies, because our ceremonies are very much binary, male, female. And there's few nations that have non-binary identities weaved into their culture and their ceremonies. But for me, I'm a sweat lodge person. So I lead sweat lodges. And the training that I got from the Cree nation on my mother's side is male and female. And I have challenged that right and left and up and down and went through the ringer because of that. Because imagine standing in front of an elder, as Salish talked about, where they're the law. What they say is highly revered and respected. And this little young queen says, excuse me, <laughs> excuse me, <laughs> right? Where do I belong? But that doesn't make sense. So it was my head talking instead of my spirit and really staying grounded in my spirit, right? Because I was challenging instead of receiving and knowing and walking through the growing up in a spiritual way that then gives me kind of some perceived authority and respect to go to a place where I then can add my perspective to ceremonies. So imagine in the 90s, there was not a lot of space for two-spirited people and the Sliwa Two Nation says, mm -hmm. Sandy, we love you. We want you here. And they opened a piece of land that I can access and lead to spirit ceremonies. They were very, very few in the 90s. Very few. In fact, I was the first one in the lower mainland of British Columbia. So this four eye seeing approach is to look at things in a different way. And it's not to fit in just one little model of a pancake. You know, when you're making cookies and there's all these different things in cookie cutters. Well, I'll never accept that. And if eventually there's a fifth, then I'll move towards the fifth perspective and identities because that's the beauty of being a human, having a spiritual experience in a human body. We have come here to learn about our humanity. It's like we just were present for Super Soul Friday. Thank you, Sandy. <laughs> I, I have to say that um, I do acknowledge all of you here. And it is so great. I'm so grateful. And it is such a relief to sit in a room with folk who understand the whole story with me and with all of us. Mm -hmm. We get to see one another. We get to be who we really are with one another. And we can shed our egos with one another and just feast together. Even if there isn't any food, it's like our souls connect and we feast one another and we leave feeling acknowledged, validated, whole, and more loved. And so it's beautiful that you're all here. And I'm so grateful for all of your beautiful minds and your energy that you're bringing to the room because it's certainly impacting the work that the four of us are trying to unpack in front of you. And so it's been, it's been quite an experience to come. I was sharing with my sister last night when we were driving to the hotel, that was magical tonight and I have to say that this morning is magical and I could just sit here and even without a mic and just be with you it's very nice and it's the medicine I've needed in the last while you know I think that there has been I actually posted that on social media has this been the longest Friday the 13th ever I don't know what it's been like in the last two weeks for my life but I seem to come across many who have been struggling lots of challenges like big big hard challenges put in front of them 
So may our energy as beautiful, divine, and super-powered human beings lift that, not just for ourselves, but for the whole world. It is time for blessings. Mm -hmm. It is truly time for blessings. Humanity has been challenged very much in the last few years, and for more reasons than just COVID, it is certainly time for blessings for all of us.